On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler ordered his troops into Poland. The German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, dropped a torrent of bombs on Poland's cities, while German tanks rolled across the countryside. It was the first use of the German military strategy called Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War, a new and devastating offensive that exploited new advances in tanks, artillery, and air power. Two days later, both Britain and France declared war on Germany. Two weeks later, the Soviet Union invaded Eastern Poland. World War II had begun. Despite the declarations of war, the next few months saw only an ominous calm settle over the Maginot Line, a labyrinth of defense fortifications along the eastern border of France. French, British, and German troops waited for something to happen. Many began to call this the phony war. As the months passed, however, the Nazis were planning their next acts of aggression. Beginning in April of 1940, the Nazis began their conquest of Western Europe. In a massive demonstration of Blitzkrieg, they invaded Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. The Germans ultimately set their sights on the conquest of France. French, British, and Belgian troops were stationed along the entire border of France, including the Maginot Line, though they left one area vulnerable, the Ardennes Forest. The French military believed that the heavily wooded area would be impenetrable to German forces. They were wrong. Hitler sent his tanks smashing through the Ardennes forest into France, effectively cutting off opposition forces. British and French troops were overwhelmed by the German military offensive into France and retreated to the French coastal town of Dunkirk. Pinned to the sea, hundreds of thousands of troops were trapped. Surrounded by the Nazis, the soldiers seemed doomed. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill appealed for help. Soon, British Navy and civilian boats of all sizes and shapes emerged to form a makeshift flotilla. In less than a week, fishermen, grocers, tugboat captains, anyone with a seaworthy vessel ferried roughly 340,000 troops to safety across the English Channel. Their heroics saved the soldiers, but they couldn't save Paris. On June 21, 1940, the French capital fell to the Nazis. Hitler dictated his terms of surrender to the French government. Germany had succeeded in conquering Western Europe. Only Great Britain remained. The British people, led by Prime Minister Winston Churchill, were defiant. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing ground. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Undeterred by Churchill's rhetoric, Hitler pressed on. In the Battle of Britain, the German Luftwaffe was ordered to bomb England. Between June and September of 1940, German planes pounded British targets. On just one evening alone in mid-August, over 1,000 Luftwaffe bombers invaded the skies over England. Germany soon began concentrating her air fury on the city of London. Londoners found refuge from the Blitz in air raid shelters and underground train stations. Frightened parents sent children out of the city to friends and relatives in the countryside. The attacks were relentless, but despite the overwhelming number of German planes, Great Britain's Royal Air Force, the RAF, fought back courageously. Using newly developed radar technology, the British were able to detect Luftwaffe planes coming over the English Channel. Early warning stations were set up along the English coast to detect the enemy and pinpoint German planes in the sky. On September 15, 1940, the RAF shot down the most German planes in a single day of battle. Defeated, Hitler called off his invasion for the time being. 
Addressing the British people, Winston Churchill gave thanks. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. But bravery alone could not win the war. Britain was crippled, with no more resources to build the planes and ships needed to withstand Germany's next attacks. Winston Churchill turned to America and FDR for help. In 1940, Franklin Roosevelt was re-elected to a third term as president, the only American president ever to serve more than two terms. Roosevelt would not commit troops to the overseas battlefield, but he vowed to help the British in their life-or-death struggle against Hitler's regime. I ask this Congress for authority and for funds sufficient to manufacture additional munitions and war supplies of many kinds to be turned over to those nations which are now in actual war with aggressor nations. Our most useful and immediate role is to act as an arsenal for them as well as for ourselves. With FDR's urging, Congress passed the Lend-Lease Plan, which allowed him to lend or lease arms and other supplies to any country whose defense was vital to the United States. Not all Americans were united in their support of the president, however. Charles Lindbergh, the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic in 1927, was a staunch opponent of America's involvement in the war. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. Despite opposition from Lindbergh and others, the Lend-Lease Act was funded with seven billion dollars. By the time World War II was over, the bill would total fifty billion dollars. Two years after making a non-aggression pact with Stalin, Adolf Hitler turned his hostilities towards the Soviet Union. In the summer of 1941, he boldly ordered three million German soldiers to invade Russia. Stalin was outraged by Hitler's betrayal, and Russia joined in the fight against Hitler, becoming an ally of the West, if only for the duration of the war. Hitler hadn't counted on the harshness of the Russian terrain and the bravery of the Russian soldiers. Military resistance and brutal winter weather took a toll on the Germans, and their invasion ground to a weary halt. America now sent Lend-Lease supplies to the Soviet Union as well as to Great Britain. But for American aid to help either nation, shipping lines across the Atlantic Ocean had to remain open. Hitler's submarines prowled the Atlantic in wolf packs, torpedoing supply ships. FDR ordered the Navy to protect all Lendley shipments and allowed American warships to attack German submarines in self-defense. In July 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill finally met face-to-face -face in Argenta Bay off Newfoundland. They agreed to issue a joint declaration on the goals of the war. Their agreement, the Atlantic Charter, became the basis for a new document called a Declaration by the United Nations, spelling out the ground rules for countries opposing the Axis powers. Twenty-six countries eventually signed on and became known collectively as the Allied Powers.